humble yourself. You know, if I'm if I'm opening up for a comedian, I have no problem selling their t-shirts after a show. I have no problem filming their set. I have no problem doing something nice, doing that little providing a value because there's a thousand comedians out there that would love to just go up and perform. But how many of those comedians will sling a t-shirt or will film the set and give them a copy of their set without asking for it and do those things? So think to yourself, how could I provide a value to this person so that they're going to want me back every time? And same thing with a comedy club. You know, if, if you're at a comedy club, yeah, everyone performs there, but are you tagging them on Instagram and help promoting their club and leaving them a good Yelp review and tipping the waitress and the bartender and making it so everyone at that club goes, oh, Ari, I love Ari. Oh, Bobby, I love Bobby. Yeah, he's welcome back anytime. You, you want to stand out. And when people think of you, you want to be thought of in a positive light. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to It's the Bearded Man podcast with your favorite, the world's favorite bearded man, Bob Bay. Each week with our guest episodes, I try to put the spotlight on someone who in my eyes is living their most authentic life. Our guest today is from San Diego, California. He's toured around and opened up for comedians such as Andrew Santino, Theo Vaughn, Eric Griffin, and more. He's a regular here in LA at the Comedy Store, the Ice House, and the Improv. He's the host of Unlicensed Therapy Podcast, where he gives unsolicited advice to his favorite friends and comedians. Your boy was a recent guest for episode 129, so make sure you go check that out. He's also the founder of Melrose Podcast Network. Today on the podcast, my new favorite comedian, Ari. Man, this is in the house, baby. How we doing? Dude, what a pump up intro, huh? It was like, half of me was like, man, I'm a (laughs) badass. And then half of me was like, okay. Let's be humble. There's, oh, too, there's no. a little too much. There's a little too much inflation here. No, you're you're a badass, dude. You, you've uh, you know, when we first met a couple weeks ago to do that podcast, I was fired up. To, you know, I had a little bit of context to who you were and kind of uh, your story. But then, really diving into getting prepped for this podcast today, I was like, my man's been putting in the time in the game, man. You you, you haven't been just like, um, you know, sometimes people get started and. Uh, they go for a couple of years and they start complaining about results, but like you have been grinding and putting in the actual work and that's clearly what's helped you get to where you are today. I'm trying. Yeah. It's gotten me right up here to my <laughs> mediocre career. No, no. It's, uh, life's good. I can't complain too much, but yeah, no, it is. It is hard work. People, yeah. you don't think so when you enter a world of show business, do you think? I, I think there's my theory that most people go to LA to pursue modeling or acting or comedy or whatever podcasting whatever it is because they think oh that's going to be so much easier Mm. than getting a job that's going to be so much easier but then they realize oh in order to make that your job you have to treat it like a real job and put in the hours so it's totally it's it's also one of these things that i've been trying i try to remind myself of of how there is like when you're trying to do something that is not normalized right like a comedian career or myself trying to get into the podcast space that is not a regular path that many take and the beauty of it though is that every single day i feel like you get to wake up with this sense of like fire under your ass of like there's always more work to be done there's always going to be things that you're working on and even when you get to like this next step where you're like this is going to be the thing everything's going to fall into place you get there and you're like okay, here's the next goal. And it's like this constant flow. So I feel like it goes two ways where it's like, it, there is no correct, correct path of how you're going to get there. But at the same time, how fortunate it is to actually have something every single day you wake up and you're like, I get to fucking work on this, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a never ending cycle. And you don't have a boss really. Mm. So no matter what you do, you always feel like, okay, but should I also do this? And this? Yeah. And this? Yeah. So how, how have you stayed disciplined over the years? Sorry, I think it glitched out real quick, but how, yeah. how have you stayed disciplined over the years when there is no boss? There's nobody over your shoulder telling you, are you need to go up and do stand up? Are you need to start this podcast? It's hard. I think it's a matter of knowing yourself and I know that I'm a lazy piece of shit. <laughs> so I set myself up in these ways where I can't be lazy or I'll feel guilty. So for example, as a comedian, one of the most common pieces of advice a famous comedian will tell you, if you say, hey, do you have any advice for me? They'll say, write and perform as much as you can. That's what mm. they'll say, right? Put in the reps. So for me, 
I moved within a five minute drive of the Laugh Factory, the Hollywood Improv and the Comedy Store. And that way, if I don't make an appearance at one of those clubs, even if I'm not performing, if I don't go hang out or show face mm. or, or do something like I'm in the thick of it. So if I miss out on one of those things, I feel like a real idiot because I have no excuse. I could get I could roll out of bed and walk down the street to the Laugh Factory. Oh. So if I don't go, it's on me. It's not on anybody else. So nobody mm. could tell me, hey, or, or I can't say to anybody, ah, I, you know, they just didn't pick me. It's all on yeah. me. It's all on me to go. So smart. That's a great example of being self-aware and going, okay, I'm going to literally put myself in the middle of this city where everything is happening for the comedy space. And then you literally, like you're saying, you don't have an excuse to not be there no. because you can crawl there. You could take a bird there. Like it's not yeah. like you have to go across town and worry about traffic. Like I have I no eaten shit on a skateboard going <laughs> to the comedy store multiple times. So, <laughs> but yeah, for me, that's, that's my mentality is make it. So if I fail, Mm. I can't blame anyone but myself. Mm. Well, what would you say to the girl if she was listening right now that inspired you to get into comedy in college? There was a oh, heart, the, I believe there was a heartbreak, the heartbreak at UC uh, Santa Cruz. At, at, oh, was that was that the total one. moment that got you into comedy? Were you already thinking about it? Well, no, it wasn't. It was indirectly. It wasn't like this flip, this switch flipped. It just so happened. It was a. Uh, a perfect timing sequence. I had mm. al- I was I had already and have always wanted to try comedy. So I don't I wouldn't thank her for that. It was just that was the moment where I was so low in my life that I needed a boost, to wake me up, a change of pace and mm. comedy just happened to fall in- into that place. Mm. So I would say to her I hope she is doing very well and that you broke my heart. <laughs> you broke his heart. All right. That's one thing that we have in common though, is me stepping into the podcast space was directly after heartbreak. So it was like a weird timing that like I was at not, I don't want to say the lowest point in my life, but I was very much in a um, dark space. Like my headspace was all messed up. I just a lot of like negativity in my life. And I started thinking about doing this podcast and I was like, if there's ever time to do it, this is going to be the time. And, and if I'm going to go all in on it, I know that I can't control how somebody feels about me, but I can control the amount of work I put into this product project. And it ultimately was the, uh, was the, one of the biggest, most pivotal moments that could have happened to me because it, it gave me permission to go, I'm going to go all in on this and not to prove her wrong, but I'm going to use this like experience as like a fire under my ass to, to move forward. So when I read that about your story and heard about it, I was like, you know, I got look, other than our charming good looks, we actually have some other parts of our story that are very common. Yeah, I mean, I think relationships, even the healthy ones, do take up a good chunk of your time. Mm-hmm. So when you end a relationship, you have free time to enter to to put that energy towards something else, such as a podcast or stand up. And also, you have a little kick under your step. You got a little boost because you're sad and you want to fill that void and you want to be, make yourself better so that that doesn't happen to you again or, you know, whatever. It, it just, it's a motivating thing sometimes, or at least you can use it that way. Maybe some people will just stay in bed when they get their heart broken and get fat and be worse, but you have to think you got to go the opposite way. Yeah. It's, you got to lean into those moments where you're kind of in the dark, but at some point you got to go, things got to change. It, Turn you- that negative thing that happened into a positive yes. the best you can to the that's best what of I'm your talking body. about that's what, that's what i'm talking about how have you gone about uh just when you said relationships a kind of light bulb moment uh, in my head especially coming to la you know it, this is a i feel very fortunate i'm four years in the four years in of living here and i very much now have like a community i've definitely built the right relationship with the right people and there's still always more room to grow but I remember when I first got here, it was very overwhelming because it's just like this major city of opportunity. But like to build that relationship, it doesn't just happen overnight. It's very much a long, slow process of like gently planting seeds and letting it naturally grow. How how have you gone about uh, building relationships, especially within the comedy space of L.A. with this being such a major hub for it? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely interesting what you say. It, it is. Yeah, it is a slow build. You can't you can't go out there thinking to yourself, oh, I'm going to meet this person and this person's going to change my life. Mm-hmm. You can't have that mentality because you will be disappointed every time. And then you're going out for the wrong reasons. Like I have, I do know people who are like, 
I don't want to go to the comedy store because. I don't want to network or something like that, but I'm like, well, you can't go into it with that mentality. You go there, (laughs) you go there to enjoy yourself and have fun and learn and watch comedy and, and get better at comedy. And if you happen to meet someone who's really a badass person that ends up changing your life, that's also great. That's amazing. And one thing that I personally have found has led me to meet a lot of great people and role models and, people who are higher up on the totem pole in the comedy world than me is to be helpful Mm. to, to be chill, to be cool, to be around, to be funny, of course, but also to be helpful so that when they think, Oh, Ari, yeah, he's great. And he's just so nice to be around. He'll help like humble yourself. You know, if I'm, if I'm opening up for a comedian, I have no problem selling their t-shirts after a show. Wow. I have no problem filming their set. I have no problem doing something nice doing that little providing a value because there's a thousand comedians out there that would love to just go up and perform but how many of those comedians will sling a t-shirt or will film the set and give them a copy of their set without asking for it and do those things so think to yourself how could i provide a value to this person so that they're going to want me back every time yeah and same thing with a comedy club you know if, if you're at a comedy club yeah everyone performs there but are you tagging them on Instagram and help promoting their club and leaving them a good Yelp review and tipping the waitress and the bartender and making it so everyone at that club goes, oh, Ari, I love Ari. Mm-hmm. Oh, Bobby, I love Bobby. Yeah, he's welcome back anytime. You, you mm-hmm. want to stand out. And when people think of you, you want to be thought of in a positive light. Yeah, that's, that's, that's so key. The way I've always looked at it is like, obviously, we all want to advance our own careers. We all have our own intentions of what we're trying to do. But I've always gone about it of, how can I make people feel good? You know, like not to make them feel good so I can kiss their ass and then ask them for a favor, but how can I make people feel good enough that they're just like, I don't know who this bearded guy is, but I want him around more. And by being around more, more doors just naturally open without you even asking for it because people start, start to take note of like what you're doing and where you're from. And they start really like getting into your story and then you, they become attached to who you are as a person bef- and not even about what you're trying to do that they naturally then go, well, how can I help? What, what can I do for you? That's going to help you get to that place in your life. But yeah, so many times I've found in uh, Gary, Gary V's a big preacher, which I know you're a big fan of Gary V's that jab, 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 right hook. It's like, just give a bunch of value as much as possible. And at sometimes you do have to stand up and, and ask for whatever that thing is you might be looking for, but it's very much being aware of like, how often have you been friends with somebody and like, is it the right time to actually ask that ask? Because if you do it too early, once you once you cross over, it is very hard to dig yourself it, out you of that You don't hole. want to be looked at as an ego. And that's probably the part that I struggle with the most is asking for things. I am not good at asking for things. Mm. Uh, I'd say that's my biggest weakness. Uh, it's just, it's an uncomfortable thing to do, but you got to do it, like you said, sometimes if, you're in, if you need someone's help. Yeah. Closed mouths don't get fed. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but what goes back to what you're saying, being happy and being positive to be around. I think, yeah, there's definitely something to say for that. If you're a bummer and you're sad all the time, people aren't going to want that around them. If you're mean, if you're grumpy, if you're mean to the people around you, no one wants that in their life. Be like, I'll just have someone else around. Why would I want that person around? The people with the pessimistic energy, I'm just like, hey, listen, I've been there and I've I've had my own difficulties and my own struggles within my own life. But by pushing that energy out, nobody wants to be around that. You know, like you talking trash about this other person. I just met you for the first and this is within the first 10 minutes. Like. Oh, so as soon as I turn my back, you're talking trash about me. So snip, snip. See you later. On to the totally. next Totally. And everybody has people they hate and everyone gets in bad moods. Listen, no one's happy all the time, but you got to be overall a pleasure to be around and not a bummer to be around. Yeah. Yeah. That's the key. You spent about five years working the door at the comedy store, which is for those listening, like it is, would you argue that the greatest club to be working at within comedy if, and, if not the, the greatest, the- one of the greatest. You know, I think uh, people might argue that the Comedy Cellar in New York might be up mm. there with it. The Hollywood Improv is a pretty legendary club. There's uh, some clubs over in Australia and the UK that are pretty legendary. But but it's definitely if top, you... Top 10, easy. Top 10 legendary. Oh, yeah. Top 5 legendary co- has broken more stars, I would say than anyone I could think of. And if you are in comedy, not just a comedian, if you're in the comedy industry, if you're a club owner, if you are a door guy at another club, if you're, if you listen to podcasts, you know what the comedy store is. It is a, it's a big deal. I mean, Mark Marin 
was the door guy there. David Letterman, Robin Williams, Ari Shafir, Tony Hinchcliffe. Uh, those are just the ones off the top of my head. There's a lot of legends that have worked there and started there. Yeah. So you spend about five years there working the door, making minimum wage. And essentially you're, you're able, because you're doing that part of the gig is like, you also get to get on stage. I don't know if it was every night or whatever it might be, but kind of just like in those early, especially in those early years when um, this is still very new to you and in, in, in being in comedy, like how are you leaning into this opportunity where you are at the top club? You know, like I think most people would argue like, don't move to these major cities until you've put in the reps, whether you're a musician, whether you're a comedian, like take advantage of that small town that you live in, put in a bunch of reps, then move to the major cities when you have a little skin under your belt. But- I think that is what most people would say. I didn't, I started in LA for the most part. I did stand up two or three times in college and then moved here. And it wasn't because I'm better or anything. I just didn't know how things worked. Yeah. I was also right down the road though, San Diego. I mean, if I was two hours away, I would have been up here much faster. Yeah, but, but uh, there's a big San Diego comedy scene. So a lot of people okay. say, oh, stay in San Diego, get better, move to LA. But I just didn't know. I just thought, oh, if you want to do comedy, you move to LA or New York. That's mm. what I, I heard somewhere. So I just moved to LA and started. But there's other people. Andrew Santino starred in LA, even though he's from Chicago. Ari Shafir starred in LA. There's a lot of great comedians that started in LA as well. So it's not the worst thing in the world. But uh, what was the original question? It was about Just like how, how did you lean into working at such a big, such a so, legendary club to help build your career? So I was uh, first I work, I kind of kind of earned my stripes, so to speak, I signed up for their open mic twice a week for six months straight, more than six months. So six months straight originally before I even got on stage for the first time. I would sign up oh every Sunday and Monday. I would go there and sign up for potluck. That's what they call their open mic, potluck. And I would wait in line for an hour and sign up every Monday and never get picked. Because basically what I came to find out is it's not a random lottery. So they say it's very political, <laughs> who you know. So finally, yeah. I Always. didn't say a word. I was like, I'm going to get picked. I'm not going to ask for help. I, I'm not going to ask. This kind of goes back to my think of not liking to ask people Mm -hmm. in my head Mm -hmm. i was like they're gonna just notice me signing up every week and they did but it took six months which probably was a bummer for me and what not what i should have just said something but anyway after six months the guy who brings out the list goes hey you sign up every week right have you ever gotten up and i'm like no i've never gotten up and of course that week i get up (laughs) and i bomb horrendously (laughs) it's horrible i was so nervous i had been practicing this set all over town (laughs) It's been, and I thought it had been doing well. And then I go up, I eat shit. <laughs> and then the process continued. But then I was kind of like, after that, at least they knew who I was. I don't yeah. know. Like, no one, it wasn't embarrassing, Bond, because there's three people in the room. It was, I went up early. It wasn't, I wasn't even embarrassed. I was just like, okay, now I need to come back and do better. So I kept signing up for probably two years, I think, before I started working there. I had been signing up. For two years, and at the same time, I had been signing up at all the other comedy clubs, the Ice House in Pasadena, mm-hmm. the Hollywood Improv, and I was running the open mic at the Ice House, and I was helping them out with social media stuff. So I was kind of in the scene. People knew who was starting to know who I was on some level, maybe not as a great comedian, but, oh, he's trying really hard to be a comedian. He's doing everything he can to, to get in somewhere. And finally, the talent coordinator at the comedy store at the time his name was Adam. He said, do you want to be a door guy here? And I said, yes, I do. Wow. Yeah. But you were smart enough to at least go, I'm trying to get into this space. The best thing I could probably do right now is just work the scenes. And if I'm not, if I'm not working the scenes, just pop in and kind of be the guy that's always there. And it's it was, somehow, some way it's going to help It was a little different. So this was at this point, eight or nine years ago. And the comedy store was starting to be popular, but it wasn't like it was now where it sold out every night. Wow. So they used to have a bigger culture of if you were a open mic comedian, if you were a brand new comedy, they would let you go sit in the back and just watch and hang out and learn Amazing. because they wanted you to get better. And that's how you get better is by watching and being around comedy. But now it's so full of audience members. There's not really and and COVID, but even before COVID, the place is so packed. You can't really go there and watch comedy as a new comedian. 
you could hang out on the patio a little bit, which is still something to do, but you can't go there and say, Hey, can I watch? Not you actually, but you got to buy a ticket. You got to buy yeah, a ticket. Yeah. You got to buy a ticket two drink and, two minimum drink. and actually be an audience member. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of a bummer in that sense, but it's, it's just because the store got so popular. I was going there when not very many people wanted to go there. Wow. Yeah. How, how do you, what, what's the moment or like, how do you know as a comedian when you're bombing? Is there just like a oh, red you, light? Here's how you know. <laughs> I mean, do, you write a joke, you know where the punchline is, you know there's supposed to be a laugh right here. And when you say the punchline and no one laughs, you're bombing. And then you think, okay, I'll give them this one. If you didn't like this one, you'll like this one. And then you do a second joke and it also doesn't get laughs. And that's when you know, Oh, this is going to be a rough one. <laughs> and you just keep going. You don't, you don't stop. You like, have to, because do I you mean, acknowledge the, the bomb? Do you acknowledge the bomb? Like, Oh folks, that looks, sounds like I'm different. <laughs> different comedians have different opinions on that subject. So some comedians would say, never acknowledge that you're bombing because then you're bombing. But if you don't acknowledge it, the audience doesn't know you're bombing something uh, like that. Okay. And then some comedians <clears throat> play acknowledge- off it play off it totally i think you can acknowledge it one to two times but if you do a third oh man you guys really don't like me i'm bombing then then you're like making yourself bomb more because then they're like yeah you are bombing why you keep you know you're kind of leaning into it too much so i think you get one kind of pity hey you guys didn't like that and that'll get a pity laugh you get one or two of those tops but yeah um, uh, uh bombing can sting more or less depending on there's factors of it too so you know like that time i bombed the first time i did potluck at the comedy store to be honest it didn't sting as bad as it sounds after waiting for six months and going bomb because there was like one or two audience members in there was a room full of comedians who are competitive and all want to be on stage where you are so they're not really very it's not a very supportive atmosphere Gotcha. So it can, it can be difficult to do well in that setting. Yeah. But if you're on a hot show with a packed crowd and everyone's doing good and you're up there for 15 minutes bombing, those that are the stings. ones that stings. And it's kind of, it gets, it gets scary after a while. Like for me, I'm at this place now where I'm getting booked on a decent amount of really good shows and I do feel a pressure to not bomb, which is good, mm. but it also makes you scared to try out new material. So mm. that's where you, you want to play it me. safe. You want to play it safe and make sure that you, you say stuff to the audience that's going to make them laugh, that they're going to now become a fan of you and that they're going to keep coming back. Whereas when you're in the early stages, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. And I think that is why people say start off in a smaller city, because if you're in San Diego, and you bomb on a hot show, doesn't matter. They're yeah. going to book you again. There's not that many comedians. You're going to get booked again. No one in the audience. Uh, I mean, they might care. But here in L.A., if you pick a hot show at the comedy store to try out new material and you bomb for 15 minutes and you're an up-and-coming comedian, you might have just bombed in front of a director of a movie. You might have just bombed in front of a headliner. You might have just been bombed in front of the booker of, you know, a late night show, a late night talk show. So you don't know who you're performing in front of and everyone in LA is someone that could potentially help you. So there's that added pressure of I'm at the comedy store. I'm in LA. I got to do good. So now I'll go to open mics around town to try out new stuff or do a shitty bar show, that kind of thing. And I use that yeah, as, my, I, as my open mic to try out new stuff. I can see that. I also look at that too, as uh, at least when I've kind of navigated the city too not judge a book by its cover and know that anybody that I'm meeting right now, even though they're not telling me what they do, they could be the ticket to the next biggest opportunity of my life. So even though I might not recognize them and they might not be a celebrity, I've always tried to approach every single person I meet with just a very genuine, same type of energy as I would be for anybody, because I've seen many times where people get introduced. This person doesn't realize that that person literally holds the key to a huge opportunity and they just dismiss them because they don't know who they are. They don't see them all glitz and glamour. They're, they're not the famous person. Yeah. And literally do they realize like all they had to do is have a genuine conversation and that probably could have led to a lot of more opportunities for them. Yeah. No, you know, there's people out there. I'm sure you know them. I know them that are 
you see them outside and you see them that they're nice to certain people and yes, they're mean they're to selective. other people. They're selective. And those people are douchebags. You don't totally. want to be a douchebag. No, like, no, no. If, if you're nice to someone that could help you and rude or short to someone who can't do anything for you, you're just, you're kind of an asshole. Yeah. You it it, it doesn't pay off in the long term. It's going to come back And right also, back to like you. you said, you don't know who's who. Now, it, like I'm so out of touch with Netflix and TikTok and so many things. Half these people I meet... I, they leave the conversation, not half of this, but I'll meet someone and they'll leave the conversation. Someone goes, Oh, that guy's so famous. I can't believe you got to meet him. I'm like, I had no idea who that was. Yeah. Cause there's so many famous people now. Like yeah. there's so many influencers and reality show TV stars it's crazy shows on HBO that no one watches. There's, you could be a TV star now with zero fame. I know it used to be that it's like the only route to famous was that you were on the TV, you're on a television. And now it's like, like you said, it could be a magnitude of platforms, YouTube, TikTok, a podcast. And if you're not in, if you're not paying attention to that actual medium, you're going to have no idea. That's, I feel the same way with TikTok right now. I, under, I have a good idea of YouTubers and, and podcasters and all the other spaces, but TikTok is one space. So I'm like, I have no idea who's the hot shit. And yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy when you look at it. I opened for uh, Polly Shore for a few years. Huge. And then most recently I opened for Theo Vaughn. Huge. And I know, you know, Polly Shore was a movie star earlier in his career, but Theo gets recognized way more than Polly, and that's from wow. a podcast. And Polly wow. was a straight up movie star. They're both famous. They both get recognized all the time. But Theo yeah. is bombarded everywhere we go. And that's all from a podcast. Wow. How what what is um how do you how do you think that relationship with Theo um has made you a better comedian or person because that was more than just you guys touring. I know there was, you guys even did like a podcast together where it was like opening the packages, I think of like fan mail or it was something along yeah. those lines. Like it definitely wasn't just like, Hey Ari, come on tour with us and that's it. And then you guys split ways. Like, I think you guys traveled the world together. You've done podcasts together. Like what is that learning or realization been from just working? With yeah. Him? It's been uh, surreal to be able to go open for him and do these giant theater shows that, you know, realistically, I'll probably never get to do again in my. Oh, episode. you'll be there. Come I mean, on, maybe come I on, will. Baby. I, I'm not being negative. I'm just saying realistically. One podcast, one one YouTube video, one piece of content. Maybe this is know. the podcast. Maybe, maybe this, this shit it. goes viral. Joe Rogan reposts it. You get called out to. to it's happening, Austin, baby. Texas. No, no, I, I'm not. I'm not trying to be negative when I say this, but it's totally. It's a once in a lifetime. You know, most comedians do not get to perform in Australia for three thousand people. So to be wow. able for him to be able to do that amazing and then for me to be able to do that with him also amazing both amazing things that uh, I'll probably never forget and it's just yeah when I when I really close my eyes and think about those experiences it's crazy but um yeah so a lot of people ask me how that came about and it's just I've been I've been a fan of his ever since I moved to LA and started comedy. And when I moved to LA and started comedy, he was not famous. I mean, he had, he was successful. He was, I would call him when I moved here in 2012, he was a low level headliner. I don't know if that sounds mean. It's not mean. He just was not, he did not sell tickets. He mm -hmm. had, he had done some <clears throat> TV appearances. He was very funny. He was one of my favorite. I always thought he was hilarious. And I, and I was not afraid to tell him that I was like, dude, you're one of my favorites. You know, I was, a, I was almost like a little fanboy. Not really. Like he was a friend, but you know what I mean? I was, I was yeah. a young comedian and I'd tell him, you know, Hey, I just moved here. You're one of my favorite comedians. But at this time he was not, he was not, he could walk down the street and no one would be like, Oh, that's Theo Vaughn. That's the rat king. So wow. then, uh, he started a podcast and I kind of, Helped him start it. I guided him a little, gave him equipment advice, just that sort of thing, because I'm a tech nerd. And you already had your podcast going at that time. I was doing it. He knew that I knew how to do podcasts, and I had one going. So he, I was giving him uh, guidance a little bit through that. I helped him pick a host to host his podcast and camera advice, stuff like that. And then when he finally, I guess, broke, I don't know the word, when he started selling tickets and started getting some notoriety and was able to afford to bring who, whatever opener he wanted. He asked me to do a couple of dates with him. And when he asked me, I thought it was, I think we both thought it was going to be a, 
one or two weekends and then it just worked out so we just kept it going wow. and, and ended up touring like you said the world and going everywhere together it was a blast it was it was crazy it, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier <clears throat> building genuine relationships and trying to give value when the opportunity arises you didn't know that at some point he was gonna have a rocket ship take off no, and then have an opportunity to then ask you to join him along if for the i ride. had known like here here's to show you how how much i didn't know like i told when he was starting the podcast I helped, you know, I helped him as much as I could, but I was like, Hey, I don't want to be your producer. Cause like, I'm focusing on my own. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I helped him, but I was not like, I, if, if I had known what it would be, I would have helped him more. I'd be like, Hey, let me, I'd be rich. <laughs> I'd be down. rich. I'd be like, let me be totally. your, let me be your producer. I'll get 10%, whatever it is. You know, I could have totally doubled down, but I didn't know. So yeah, it was all organic and I was just helping out a friend, you know, what I would do for, for anyone else who asked me for help. I would say, Oh, I'll help you as much as I can. I obviously can't do it full time, but I'll teach you how to do it. So that's yeah. kind of what it was. I, I taught him how. Man, that's Just amazing. Well, I, I know, I know um, <clears throat> we talked about it a little bit briefly when I was on your podcast, but 24, I mean, when I, when we were chatting about doing your podcast, I looked up your podcast. I saw that it had started in 2014 and yeah, you might've had a couple in, inconsistent times, whatever. Every podcast goes through that phase, other things, especially you're doing stand up that takes a bigger priority. So I would imagine when you were on tour, you can't prioritize the podcast or whatever. So there's a lot of things that kind of jump up, but you, you had foresight to jump into the space very early in 2014. Like, I mean, when I started paying attention to 2015, it was still bubbling, but nowhere near what it is today. What mm -hmm. was kind of your vision of starting unlicensed therapy? Was there really like anything other than just like, let me use this as an outlet to work on my comedy slash talk to people or you know, I wish I could tell you this inspirational story of how it came <laughs> out. I'm, I'm just, it's straight up, I'm just a nerd, right? So yeah. before comedy podcasting, before Mark Marin and Joe Rogan, uh, I used to listen to podcasts. I want to say back in high school, even in 2007, 2006. What, what were they and producing back then? What so were the podcasts? Back then, podcasting was basically just on iTunes and there was another app you could download on a Windows computer and I was listening to them on the computer not even I, I didn't even have a smartphone I don't think or an Android or they didn't have maybe they had an iPhone 1 I can't remember but you would download these podcasts and they were mostly technology based podcasts so I remember there was one called This Week in Tech by Leo Laporte who had a show on AM radio on KFI AM 640 where he gave people technology advice mm. and i was i was a big tech nerd so i was listening to tech podcasts and i'm sure there was some comedy podcasts but i didn't even know about them i don't think there was i wasn't into comedy at all at this time this was there was definitely no wtf with mark Marin. there was no joe rogan you know now that i say this i remember hbo had a stand-up clips podcast where each week they would release a wow they were ahead of the ball too audio stand-up clip and then i kind of forgot about it for a few years i kind of phased out and then i think for the big one for a while was wtf with mark Marin, and i would mm -hmm. listen to him interview comedians who i really liked i think i stumbled across it because he was interviewing louis ck and i found out about mm -hmm. louis ck through that hbo podcast thing so it was mm -hmm. uh I went, you go down these rabbit holes, like the internet is Wikipedia rabbit holes, <laughs> podcast. Rabbit. So I went down the podcast rabbit hole and I was listening to Marin and then I stumbled across Joe Rogan's podcast. So I always kind of had it in my mind. And then I thought of that idea on licensed therapy where I'll have my friends come in and give them advice. Mm. And I was just, it was almost just an experiment. I, that's what I think it was when I started. It was just another thing to try out and experiment with and learn how to do it was fun to you know what's fun for me is just the process of learning how to podcast becoming mm. good at that getting the audio better getting the video better getting the intro made getting the outro made making it look professional it's just it's kind of like starting a business or a website it's just fun to build it up so i did it and i think i did 20 episodes something like that 15 20 episodes but no one listened to it. It was maybe 50 to 200 people would download yeah. it, something like that. So when you don't do an episode, there's no one going, hey, where's the episode this week? <laughs> you know, it's, a, there's, it's very hard. It's hard to motivate yourself because you don't get that instant gratification you do doing stand-up comedy. When mm. you do stand-up, 
you're getting laughs on stage. You're getting high from it. It's, it's a drug. When you do a podcast, you're kind of just uploading it and no one's seeing it. So it's, it is hard to be motivated. Yeah. But then, like you said, I started seeing all these comedians have careers because of their podcast. Yeah. And then I started opening for a guy whose career was because of his podcast that I was kind of witnessed from the start that I helped him start in, in some facet. So it was very motivating. And I meant, and I thought to myself, man, like I got to do this and I got to stick with it because you don't know. And it's, it's a long road because I don't have famous people that put me on their podcast. Like some people do some people, you know, they get on Joe Rogan three times and boom, now their podcast is making money. So mine's yeah. been very, <clears throat> Schultz, Schultz very comedian. I feel like for at least in the comedy space, I feel like Andrew Schultz ha has had a, he was already established, but I think he's had a lot of, uh, progress in his career from some of the Rogan appearances on top of obviously a lot of the content he's been doing the last year or two, but I, I feel yeah, like Tim Dillon, Ari Shafir, yep. Joe Rogan's kind of the Carson of our era. Johnny Carson yeah. was a late night talk show host for the year longer, your uh, younger audience who don't know who Johnny Carson was. He hosted a late night talk show before Jay Leno did. The, he was the precursor to Jay Leno. Yep. And he used to have stand up comedians come on and do five minutes. And if you had a good five minutes on Johnny Carson and he invited you back good. to the couch, you would be touring people. You could say I was on Carson. You'd per headline every comedy club in the country. Now you either got to be famous or get on Joe Rogan a few times to be able to like, that's really the avenues for a stand up comedian. So, uh, it's been, it's been a slow organic growth, but it has been growing and it's been fun and it's, it, now more people listen to it than they did before, which is great. And it's been, it's been motivating. Yeah, dude, you have a, you already have a passionate, a couple of things I want to say, you have a, you have a very a clear passionate audience because even after the podcast I did with you, mm -hmm. the last three reviews were like, Hey, just heard you from Ari's podcast. Like, can't wait to listen. I was like, damn, he's, he's got some like cult people. They haven't even listened in there. Oh, that's review, great. Which is like, I was like completely like taken away by, um, secondly is like, I know you had mentioned like with, uh, with comedy you're getting like that instant gratification when you're on the stage right but mm -hmm. i almost would almost argue too you're not though because of the time you're putting in to actually work the bit think it through before you even get a chance to go on stage so i would almost argue it's very similar in the in the sense of like you had to do the prepared work to then have the opportunity to get the instant gratification and i think with podcasts it's the same you might have a little bit of prep work beforehand you actually record the podcast but i think the instant to me, the gratification always has been just publishing, just hitting that publish button has been like, we did it. We, we did it again. True. We got another out episode mean, out there. I guess what I mean is the gratification is can be different because if you're for me, when I was first doing my podcast, yeah, it feels good to hit publish. But then that was it. I wasn't getting feedback. No one was listening. I didn't I didn't know. Like it, it says 50 people listen, but maybe one person listened. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I really didn't know. So it's, you know what? I don't know if that makes sense. It's when you go to your YouTube number and you see, uh, you know, I, I had more episodes than I did views on my video. Mm. Uh, so it's kind of, uh, not, it just wasn't very motivating. I'm like, who am I doing this for? What am I, why am I putting this out if no one gives a shit? Yeah. But, but it's like hey. that. But if you have, you can't have that mentality because, you might, you might, you know, all of a sudden one episode is going to pop and then they'll go totally. back and listen to all your old episodes. It's one thing to see numbers growing, but I think, and you would probably agree with this, like the, the thing that keeps the fire inside you going is like actually seeing like a comment, like, yo, this yeah. is great. Or like seeing somebody reshare an episode on your story. You're like, wow, somebody was so impacted for a magnitude of reasons for whatever that is that they wanted to share it out or they wanted to leave a comment. That's the, like, I'll take. 10 comments over 10,000 views because it's like, these are actually, I'm seeing people, I'm seeing like an actual human totally. being like type of comment versus like these numbers keep growing. But if I'm not getting like true feedback of like, this right. is great, didn't like this, learn this. I'm like, all right, now I have something to work with versus like, cool, numbers are rising. I have no context to like, what did you enjoy? What did you hate? What do you want more of, you know? Absolutely. Getting a DM yes. or, or someone will send me a message about something I said on a podcast that I have no recollection of even saying. They'll be like, oh, remember when you told this story? And I'm like, what? And then they remind me and I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, so, they're actually listening to me. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, so it's just feeding my mental illness, you know, listening to me and giving me the attention that I've been seeking. That's that's what it's all about. That's what we're all here to do, Ari. Right? We're, we're here to yeah. talk about you, man. If you could have any guest on your podcast tomorrow that is alive right now, who would it be and what's one question you would ask them? Oh, that's the question you should have prepared me for. That's tough. Uh, Take your time, sir. Uh, I mean, I have a... Okay, I mean, I... You only get one, I, brother. Okay, I, I've said this answer before, so I'm just going to keep saying it to, uh, to make it happen one day. I want to interview Keanu Reeves. Okay. Uh, I think he's a very talented actor. I've heard nothing but all these amazing kind things about him and sad stories about people in his life. Mm. So I really would. And he, to me, he also, even though there's a lot of info about him on the internet, there's something mysterious about him to me. Agreed. Like, like I feel like I don't know who he is at yeah. all. So I would just, I would just want to get to know him. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I need to. I don't know. I wish I knew specifics enough, but I know I, I like what I from what I know of. Like he's given away a lot of his money. He's had a very rough like life outside of his film career. Yeah. So I don't know the true context of it. I, I definitely would need to research so I could speak on it more, but. Um, yeah, I, I, I could see him being a very yeah, interesting and like conversation. A lot of these things about his life almost seem as though they are urban legend. I don't even know if they're true. You know, I think I read somewhere that he gave away all the money from his movies yes, to the yes. cast. I've read that like his wife and his brother and his dad died and all these people died in his life. And obviously that's horrible. But part of me is like, is that even true or is that just a uh, tiktok video i don't even know i so i just i kind of want to ask him about all these things because it's it's very intriguing he's he's an intriguing man yeah that that, that would be a great guest to have on, on the show for sure yeah and and i can't think of a maybe he's done a podcast if he has i haven't listened to it we gotta find so it so like I'll do some digging like you know i would it. i would love to interview louis ck my favorite comedian too but he's done podcasts mm -hmm. he's been on mark maron he's been on other on opie and anthony so that's been done. Yeah. I think we're starting to see it's an interesting wave right now, but I think we're really starting to see a lot of celebrities either step into the space and host their own podcast or be on shows where you ne you haven't heard them before. They've never been on a podcast. And now, so it's a really interesting time. Like there's certain shows that I follow like smart list with Jason Bateman, um, yeah. Sean, uh, Sean Hayes and Will Arnett. Like they're pulling in celebrities that you I've never heard on a podcast for the first. And so to hear them for the first time, like, Oh, this is like, this is juicy. Like I, they've never been on any other show. So anything they talk about is new to me. Whereas you have other people that go on press runs and it's pretty much the same podcast for every show right. to a certain extent. Absolutely. Yeah. It's interesting to see. And, and you mentioned in my fabulous intro that I'm, that I <laughs> run this podcast network. And what's interesting is everyone's podcast. They're basically reaching out to their network of people. And everyone's network is a little different. So you see mm. people starting these podcasts and and as these new, you know, originally podcasting was big in the tech space and now it's then it was big in comedy and now it's starting to get big mainstream. So like you said, you're seeing, you know, Will Arnett, Jason Bateman, they're, they've been in the acting game for probably 20, 30 years. Their Hollywood network is vast and huge and huge and deep. So they're getting all very interesting people that, like you said, you haven't really seen on podcasts before. So it is cool as the podcasting space grows there. Everyone's getting into it. Just everyone. So athletes, there's athlete, there's a, there's yeah. a baseball podcast now where they get all these MLB players, like any subject you want to learn about, you could literally, literally hear the best people in the world go on a podcast and talk about. How about Barack Obama and Bruce Springsteen dropping a podcast this year? Unbelievable. It's crazy. Chappelle, it's Dave Chappelle started one. Uh, it's just. Anybody. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's who knew, who knew this is what it was going to come to, but it makes sense because you know, the other, the, the traditional TV and late night shows, they're too bogged down by the staff of people controlling it and putting in there. There's too many cooks in the kitchen. A yeah. podcast is one guy making all the decisions. That's what I think people want. Yeah. And the thing is with the pandemic, if anything, this only sped up time, probably two to five years for the actual podcast space, because you had all of these high clientele celebrities that 
couldn't do their profession were able to step into the podcast space because it was remote. They could just connect to the Wi-Fi. They didn't have to travel places. They could do it similar to what we're doing, where you're sitting in the comfortability of your own home. I'm in, in my home. We can do this remote. The sound is going to sound amazing as if we were in person and we get to both log off and go about our daily lives. You could literally be anywhere in the world right now. So I think that's another thing with the pandemic. It just inspired more, uh, more celebrities to get into the space because what else were they doing? There wasn't many options. Like if you were in the film industry, that was shut down for some time. If you were an athlete, that was shut down. So mm-hmm. this was one of the few spaces that, if anything, thrived during that time because people true. were looking to consume content. Yeah, that's true. I never even really thought about that. But yeah, during the pandemic, any, a lot of people started podcasts. I didn't really yeah. think about that. Yeah. I'm smarter than I look, Ari. You look very <laughs> smart. Yeah. Um, the the Melrose podcast network though, just to go off of that, I think it's like amazing that like it, you kind of lean into this opportunity where it kind of just naturally happens. I don't, I, I, from our previous conversation, I don't remember you saying that like you just like woke up one day and was like I'm gonna start a network. It kind of just happened where you were able to team up with somebody, start their podcast, and then it kind of like just became like a domino effect. How yeah. how has now operating as a network change your perspective of like the business and the industry versus before. And still to this day, you run your own show, but that, that, that is your show. That is your thing. But now you're Mm -hmm. operating on the other side where it's like total business and you're just kind of overseeing the entire production for some of these shows. It's, I, it's, it's weird, man. It's, I never thought of myself as, a guy who would own a business and that's really what it's become. Like, I don't even know how to do my taxes. I don't <laughs> get you account. Maybe I don't even know. You know what I mean? I don't totally. even, I couldn't even tell you how much money I made last year because <laughs> I don't, I don't even operate that way. I make my money and I buy what I need and yeah. I make sure that I don't have zero money left after yeah. I buy what I need. That's how I live. I, I am not, I barely graduated high school. I barely graduated college. I am not a businessman by anyone's definition of me. Mm. But it it just happened that I knew how to do podcasts. I know production. I'm a tech nerd. And me and my friend were like, hey, let's figure out a side hustle to do because comedy money is not consistent. You know, one one year in stand up, I'll make a living, and then one month goes by, and I didn't get booked that month, and I made no money that month. Mm. So it's just it's scary to be a comedian when you're not uh, famous mm. because you're living gig to gig, and there can be a month where you don't get booked that much, and then if you didn't save money from the previous month, you know you're fucked, or you have to go drive for Uber that that month or whatever it is. Yeah. So. I was like, okay, what can we start? So we started this podcast studio and originally it was just to rent out to people because that's what I knew how to do. I knew how to pick out the equipment. I knew how to shoot. I knew how to edit. So it was just production. And then, like you said, um, we were recording for Call Her Daddy. Harry Jousey was the guest. He said he wanted to start a podcast. So we just said, hey, we could do it for you. And we did it for him. And then all of a sudden, similar timing, a few other people reached out to us to do it for them. And all of a sudden, before you know it, without even trying, we were doing podcasting full time for four or five different podcasts. So it's like we kind of have a network (laughs) and we weren't trying to start a network. It was just we had one. So like, okay, I guess we should make we need to hire someone to do ads for this network. And then I matched with this girl on Hinge who happened to be doing that another company. And then that company had to be happen wow. to be moving states. So she's like, hey, I don't have a job right now because I don't want to move to Texas. So why don't I come help you? So it just it literally happened in the most organic way possible where all of a sudden we had five podcasts. Now we have this girl selling ads for the podcast. <laughs> We're doing production. Then my brother, he worked on a TV show and that it was off. Uh, they finished production for that year. So he wasn't doing anything. So he's like, Hey, I know these uh, five other pod. He reached out to a bunch of podcasts and got five more on the network. Now we have 15 shows that we're doing (laughs) all this thing stuff for. And it's literally turned into this full time thing. And now we have I have employees and we're going to have to move into a bigger studio. It's just that was quick. 
but it's all been, it has not been this goal or grand vision of mine. It's just happened purely organically. Yeah. So it's been wild. It's one of those moments where it's like the world is, is I don't want to say giving this to you, but like you have to just lean into it. Like the fact that totally. you match to, you match Alyssa on a dating app. Yeah. And then she's, her company that she's working for that's buying the podcast stuff is now leaving states. And now she's like, like that in of itself is just like, you are supposed to start this network. This is yeah. supposed to be what you're doing. Oh, now there's people choosing our podcast network over the one she used to work for. There's <laughs> it's it's wild and it, yeah, it's it's just one of those things where it's fun. I'm having fun with it, so I'm gonna keep doing it, and it's growing beyond my wildest expectations in different ways in different parts of the business that I never thought we'd be doing. And it's fun. I, I could, you know, part of me goes, man, if my comedy career was as good as my podcasting career, then then all my dreams would have come true. But but it's mm-hmm. a, it's new dreams and it's new things. And I'm just following it and I'm still doing comedy. I have, so it's just, yeah, it's crazy. It's you crazy how life works. It's never what you and, think is going to do is going to happen happens. It's always something else. And you just got to be able yes, to accept but it. But guess what? It's still going to course correct you back to the comedy, though. You might be spending a lot of time and energy building this business right now because this is all new. You're putting in systems, you're you're hiring employees, like it's moving really fast and you probably just wake up every day and you're just putting all your time and energy into it. But at some point it's going to get efficiently into this process and flow where it's running itself. You probably make some of the higher level decision making. You probably put somebody in place of who you would be as an acting CEO or whatever. And then you're going to be able to build probably even more relationships in the comedy space through this network. And then if you're right back to where you need it to be, right back into the comedy space. So yeah, I, it, it probably feels like it's derailing you, but I feel like it's just going to fully swing back you in. Like that was kind of the thing when I stepped into this opportunity with Liquid IV. I was like, as a podcast meeting bu- media buyer, I was like, wow, I'm this is an incredible position. Um, but now this is going to be my number of priority. My own podcast career is not going to be the priority because this is obviously like full time. This is a career. But it allowed me to learn the, be- yeah. the media buying of the space. It allowed me to meet people like you. It allowed me to has allowed me to keep building people in the space. And I I know that at some point it just it's going to swing back full circle where I will do this as a full time career as a podcaster. Yeah. But while it's while while I'm still doing this, I'm just like so I'm trying to be a sponge, I'm trying to soak it all up, build really good connections, do really well for Liquid IV, and 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 build really strong partnerships. So that way, when I do make the leap and I'm out there doing my own show and my own thing that this thing is still running itself. So I think it's hard because we, we, I, I can think of one podcast where it's like they started and they took off and that's it. It's like, Oh, but now I have to go left, right center to get back to where I wanted to be. But as long as I get to where I wanted to be, every well, like you said, it's, it's going to be good for your podcasting because now you know the other side of the business. Totally. So now you know, okay, there's brands that probably would like it if I did this or didn't do that. Yes. You know, it kind of gives you a business facet of what these companies are looking for when it comes to advertising on podcasts. So that's invaluable. It's totally. kind of the same thing in comedy. A lot of times someone will be like, what should I, I'm not getting booked on shows. A, a new comedian will say that, Hey, I'm not getting booked on shows. What can I do to get booked on more shows? And one thing that I'll say to do is I'll say, well, if you're not getting booked on shows, start your own show. Mm. make like create take, the opportunity create the opportunity yes. because uh yeah you know you can't just be going around begging people to do their shows if you really want to do their show start your own show and put them on your show and yes. then they're going to probably yes. if you do and if they see you do good they may mm. they might have you on their show you know you don't know you don't do it expecting that but it, it very well could happen and then you get the response some people go yeah but i don't want to be a producer I say listen you don't have to produce it forever <laughs> but but you're going to learn that side of it. You're going to learn when you produce a show, you're going to learn all these things that are going to help you when you're a comedian on other people's show. Cause you're going to know what it's like to be in their shoes. You're going to know what to things that you should not say to them. You're going to be able to be a leader. Them, and you're going to know how to behave and you're going to know, okay, you need to show up on time because you know how annoying it is when comedians are late. You know, you're going to need to not piss off the crowd because that producer is right. You're going to know all these things that, that are that are obvious if you've ran a show before, but some comedians show up thirty minutes late and then they walk the crowd and then they're they don't tip the bartender and you go, Oh, they do not know how to behave. But these are yeah. things you learn 
from running a show. So it never hurts to try out a new thing in the space that you want to be in. Yeah. One thing I didn't get a chance to call out, but it, this kind of goes right into it, is like, I, and this is def, this is more towards the later part of your career versus the earlier part, but like you created an apartment show, like where you do once a month stand up in your apartment. And when I saw that, I was like, this is a great example of not only creating your own opportunities, but making it work with what you have. Yeah, maybe maybe you don't have the stage with the thousands of dollars of lights and an arena full of you know three hundred people, but you were you have been able to turn your apartment into a sh- a showcase where people are doing stand up and and uh, yeah, I just like when I saw that it was like this is a great example of creating your own opportunities. That that to me has been like religious in my mind of these last couple of years is like if you can't get to the place you're trying to go, find a way to create it at a minimal level. And then use that as leverage to get you to that bigger opportunity. It's, pr- well, it's you, proof of concept. Yeah, that how that apartment. So I do a I did a show before the pandemic once a month in my living room, where I would clear out all my furniture and I built a stage and spotlights and curtains and microphone and speakers and all. I I put a stand up comedy show in my living room, right? And how that came about, actually, like I have a relationship with every comedy club in LA. I could go to the Improv or the Comedy Store or the Ice House and say, "Hey, can I run a show at your venue?" And they would all say yes. But what a lot of people don't realize is that because a lot of comedians are like, oh, I'd love to run a show there. But what you don't realize when you run a show at the comedy store, there's a lot of pressure on you because if you don't sell tickets to your show, if your show is empty, they're not going to have you back at that yeah. club. You're kind of burning well, a bridge. Time and money. Like if you're going to if you're going to step into a situation like that, you you want to be ready. So the nice thing about my living room here is if five people show up to the show, sure, it wouldn't be the greatest for the show, but there's no consequences. You yes. know what I mean? The consequences are uh, just me having a uh, not that good of a show in my living room. But <laughs> I don't have to. I don't have to worry. Oh, I'll never get booked in my living room again because of it. <laughs> yeah. You want to you know use I mean? you want to use that ticket for the comedy store of like hosting there when the, when you're fully in on it. Like you don't want to use it. Use that ticket. That ask right. You don't want to use that ask and then it, it, it doesn't work out the way you want. So you want to ask when you know it can deliver yes. to the level. So, of what you so want yeah, deliver. it's part of that. And it's part, it's partly again, when you perform at the comedy store, you want to be doing your best shit. So for me, this was my experimentation zone. This mm. is where I could go and it's my domain. I'm the king of my domain. It's, it's all me. So it was fun to, I got to book the comedians. I wanted to book my friends. There was zero pressure on audience. It was a unique fun goofy thing in my living room and you know what it ended up even that ended up being uh just bigger than i imagined because it was such a weird unique thing that everyone wanted to check it out and and every single show ended up being 30 plus people which doesn't sound like a lot but for my living room it's packed it was a fire it (laughs) was a fire hazard so every (laughs) single show ended up getting super packed uh Airbnb ended up putting it on one of their first five Airbnb experiences. So they started selling tickets for me to it. Wow. It got, it got ended up getting written up in Forbes and it was on, you know, the local TV stations here. So it ended up being, and then I, you know, I had Theo Vaughn in here and Santino wow. and Griffin and all these big comedians ended up performing in my stupid living room because it ended up being such a fun, goofy event. I bet you, and I bet you too, like with, with those, at least those, those people you just uh, rattled off where, um, at this point in their career, you know, they do it at a very high level where it's these packed rooms, you know, fa- thousands of people at a time, literally thousands. Yeah. I would imagine that it's good to get back to the roots and do stuff like this, where it's, it's pure fun. And it probably just grounds them of like, this is like, this is where I started, you know, like it's these right. type of environments, these types of rooms where it's like 20, 30 people, everyone's shooting the shit. Like. I, I feel like those are, they probably appreciate those moments. And then you appreciate it too, because it's like, these are really high level comedians. You're building relations with them. You know, they're coming to your apartment to do some stand up. Like that's obviously a great look on you too. It ended up being my dumb little apartment show that I started almost as a joke. <laughs> I would have comedians hitting me up who wanted to do it. You know what I mean? Like wow. people messaging me, Hey, I need to do your apartment show. There was one night where Mark Norman was on the show who's a, another big comedian and the power went out on the whole block so he gets here the sound doesn't work there's no lights on we ended up putting like a candle on the table 
and he was just yelling at the crowd with no <laughs> microphone. And he killed. And he murdered. He murdered in my living room. So that was the type of environment it was. Wow. But yeah, it was it was it's a, wild. It's a clear theme uh, in your life, it sounds like, that things are just, they, you kind of have an idea, you kind of just chase it, and then it all just kind of works itself out. Or it doesn't, but you have fun <laughs> along the way. Yeah, it works out or it doesn't. But yeah, my next, I have a, another idea I actually want to do. I need to start planning it because I haven't really planned it much, but I want to do it at the end of July. Uh, I want to do Ari's Apartment Comedy Festival. Mm. And I want to do a full three days three shows a night all in my living room. Wow. That could be epic. That's sell festival passes. And just oh, that's cool. Make it really stupid. No, that's, that's good. And especially now with things kind of opening back up, people are just itching to go do things. And uh, that would probably easily fucking crush if, uh, if you can get it together for the end of July. Yeah. That's my latest. That's my latest. Maybe, maybe I'll come try that's to my do, latest idea. Maybe I'll break in my first stand up in Ari's apartment. We could do a live. We could do a live podcast. That that would be sick. That could be one of the shows. Yeah, that that could be sick. That could be definitely be sick. Um, you're a big reptile guy. <laughs> yeah. You have a. Uh, I think, do you have a snake there? I let's see if you could see it from this angle. Uh, I don't know if you way back on that uh, on the black shelving. Yes. What do you got? Shelving. I have a western hog nose snake. What is that? It's a it's a fairly small snake, uh, really cute. They have a pushed up pig nose. That's why they're called hog nose. Okay. Oh, I think I know and, what you're talking about. And yeah, they're really friendly snakes. They burrow and they play dead, and they're just kind of funny looking snakes. And I've always liked reptiles. They're, the real reason I have reptiles is they're easy to take care of. You know, as a comedian, I leave town a lot. Mm. I go on the road. I could leave my snake alone for a week. It's fine. No, no issues. Does not get, could care less that I'm gone. <laughs> Doesn't get hungry. You know, you feed them once a week, once every two weeks even. So wow. it's just really low maintenance pets. If you could have any reptile in the world and like the, the expenses of taking care of it were covered, what would it be? Any reptile? Uh, there's this thing called a rhino iguana. And iguana? It, it's a rhino iguana specifically. A rhino iguana? And the reason why it's called a rhino iguana is because they're gray and white as opposed to the normal iguanas are green. Mm. But they're a lot tamer than the green iguanas. And they're friendly that they've been known to come up to people because they like to be pet. So they have a bigger personality. They're almost wow. like, like uh, a dinosaur type of dog. That's pretty badass. That's what I want to do. One, <laughs> one day. They're yeah, a few pretty, thousand bucks. That's though. pretty badass, dude. Yeah. That, how much? thousand bucks? They're a few thousand bucks, yeah. And, oh, then, few and thousand. then you have to feed them every day because they're big. You got to have a big enclosure for them. So it's, you know, they're not they're not the easiest pet to keep in the world. Yeah. The other the other thing that I can see behind you is your uh, your longboard. You're, you've been a big longboarder uh, for a long time. I know back in, I think it was 2010, you skateboarded from Newport, Oregon to New York City. It was like 3,000 yeah, miles in total. Uh, uh, and it, it was feel, it feels like a lifetime for, ago, even though it was, I guess, yeah, it was 11 years ago. It was 11 ago, years ago at this point. At this point. But you, you guys you guys did this to raise money for youth services. But uh, back then, like, what was the intention of the trip other than raising money? Was this like a I mean, yeah, to be, to be honest, you know, obviously, that's great that we raised money for at-risk youth. But that was just something to say. We just wanted to do it for ourselves. It was a selfish trip. I just wanted to skateboard. I was really into longboarding at the time, and of course, I had this Southern, you're a Southern California was, kid, dude. Like, yeah, what, that's San like what Diego. you guys are born with. Yeah, from skateboarding San Diego. and surfboard. Let's let's ride, boys. Surf every summer, skate every day. Unbelievable. I, I most people don't believe me when I tell them because I'm just like a nerdy looking dude. But yeah, I love skating and surfing. And it was again. I think you know from this conversation, I'm realizing I just get obsessed with things. Mm. whether that be stand up or podcasting or longboarding and there was a few year stretch of my life where i was obsessed with longboarding and i got into this real niche sport called long distance longboarding where people would race long for long distances or see how far they could go and i had this crazy idea to skateboard from one side of the country to the other side of the country and at first it sounds crazy, but I think what initially made me think the idea is I saw someone did it on a bike and I'm like, 
hey, longboarding is a little harder, harder than a bike, but if you could do it on a bike, you could do it on a longboard. If there's paved roads and why not? Yeah. So I told my family and friends I want to do it. And they said, you can't do that. You know, no, <laughs> no one believed me. I remember I have a clear memory of telling someone in college and I wasn't doing it in a bragging way. It may seem that way, but I, I was telling someone about the trip that I wanted to do or that I was planning on doing. And some, I remember someone goes, you're never going to do that. There's no way you're going to, you're not going to do that. You're just telling people you're going to do it to, to be cool. You, you're not going to do it. And I'm like, what? Like, what are you talking about? And then he ended up being right because the trip got canceled like two years in a row wow. because other skate, other people around me who I wanted to do the trip with ended up bailing out Damn, because it's a, it's, it's a, a big, full commitment. It's a full it's a big commitment. It's a big yeah. commitment. It's like a summer. It took a whole summer basically to wow. plan and do. So I finally, the third year, I, cause I remember the second year, the news came out and did a story on it. And then the trip mm. didn't happen after the news did a story on it. Buzz so it was kill. just, it was embarrassing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So the third year I was planning it, I literally took a semester off college, worked, saved up, paid for me and all the people to do it, planned it out to the T, got people to fully commit. I said, Hey, this trip is, this is the third year I'm planning it. Do not tell me you're going to do it unless you're actually going to fucking do it. Mm. So I got people to do it and we did it. Good for you willing to take a semester off to work to save the money to pay for the whole team to actually be able to do it. I it was a at that point it was a pride thing because it yeah. had been canceled two times. It was like <laughs> I I told everyone in my life I'm doing this thing. I and have to do it. Happen. I yeah. looked I looked like an idiot. Wow, you're the second person on this podcast that did something across America about two months ago. I had a guy who actually ran it. He ran, ran across, across America. He ran See, across that America. to me sounds crazy. 13, he did. I think he averaged, I forget how many miles a day, but it took about 177 days, I want to say. Wow. Yeah. It's like half, what is that, half a year almost? Pretty much. Six months of his life running started, across? He started, and he's from San Diego too, actually. Uh, I, I forget what part. Blood down there. You damn San Diego people getting the sun year round, you're just like, yeah, let me go run, let me go across America until you get to the East Coast and you're freaking cold. But yeah, he started in, in New Jersey and, uh, and in San Diego. To me, man, oh, after month two, I mean, it took it took us under two months, but by the end of the trip, I gotta be honest, like it was a rewarding experience, but You're I had it. I was very over it by the end yeah, of that I believe trip. It. I believe I was it. very over not not over longboarding, but over that trip. Yeah. So I could only imagine running for six months. Yeah. That sounds awful. Yeah, it, it definitely was a challenge for him where he was in a place in his life where he got into running because of he just exited his company, but then was also like drinking a lot, just was in a very negative headspace and then running like pulled him out of it. And then it's kind of one of those things where he's like, I want to push myself to the utmost comfort, like comfort zone. And he said, I'm, I'm going to run across America. And he did it. Wow. Savage. Shout out to Brady That's Silverwood. Savage. He's an absolute savage. What um, are you going to do? You got to top it. Oh, don't get, uh, don't, you know, I'm lucky I get my five to seven miles, maybe four to five days a week. That's more Running than me. across America. That's tough, man. You got to run across Africa or something. You got to <laughs> beat it. I'll be burnt up. You see this white, you see this white pasty skin? I would be torched by the end of running across Africa. A lot of sunscreen. Just, yeah. You know, cake I, they got to come up with like 1000 SPF, dude. I would need, <laughs> I would need some heavy layers of that. I would need somebody to dr do a drive by spraying me as I'm running at the same time. That would be nice. Yeah. That'd maybe be a I'll, nice service. Maybe I'll have you come fly in to do it. Yeah, dude. yeah. I'll do I'll be the drive by <laughs> sunscreen sprayer. <laughs> Put that in the IG bio. That'll get the woman going yeah. crazy. Um, we're gonna get into quick cues as we wrap up. These are really short, quick, and simple. Um, what daily routines help you operate at your highest level? Are there any daily things that you do that you need to do? So on a good day, I have a routine. Mm -hmm. Uh lately my days have been packed with non-routine things just because they've been busy mm -hmm. but on a good day i sleep in till 10 30 a.m mm. drink a bottle of water take a shower <laughs> with, some go on, IV in the water. Go with some liquid iv in the water of course <laughs> always always liquid iv goes in my water i don't uh, without without i don't even call uh regular water water without liquid <laughs> iv it's not water to me that's just like dirt from the ground it needs liquid iv to be water so have a glass of water and then i go on my a hike mm. 
Then I'll probably come back, eat a nice lunch. Mm. Maybe get a podcast in or mm. work on the podcast a little bit. And then go do a set at the comedy store at a comedy club. And then come home, have a nice late night snack. Go to bed. Sounds like a good day to me, man. Yeah, that would be, that's my perfect day. That's That sounds like a good day to me. Yeah, that's 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 the deep that's, that's the what i like to call ari's dialed in baby that's my day is good if i just if i could get a hike in a mm -hmm. good healthy meal and a good set at, yeah. at a comedy club yep i think those, those are, are the only things the small need. wins man those are the small wins um if you had to tell yourself one motto every morning what would it be to jumpstart your day oh wow a motto yeah I don't have any motto. I should have yeah. some mottos. Uh, pull, you know, pull, I, to, pull it out of Tony Robbins' book. You I'll, gotta have I'll something. steal. Yeah, I I could steal some mottos. There's a guy named uh, shit. What's his name? He was Mr. Olympia six times. Mr. Olympia. Times. Let me look it up. Right. Yep. Now. Look it up. Mr. Olympia six times. It's it's a pretty good flex. A lot of times. Sure. A lot of times. Oh, uh, Ronnie Coleman. That was his name. Oh, what a G. So I don't know if you've seen. He's been on Rogan, but I've yeah, known, he's got I've a known documentary. about him pre-Rogan. Yeah, I've known about him pre-documentary. I knew about him. I don't even know. I didn't even know about him through bodybuilding. Obviously, I'm not a bodybuilder. But I don't know. You, those look pretty big yeah, back there. Yeah, pretty freaking strong, baby. Uh, no, I knew about him because he had these dumb videos on YouTube. Not even dumb. Of him working out, and they made me laugh so hard because... <laughs> And this was real. It wasn't him trying to be funny. I mean, I think he was naturally a funny guy. But when he was working out, he would say things to motivate himself. Mm, like talk to himself. And yeah, he would talk to himself right before he's about to lift these giant weights. Like these weights that no normal human man could lift. Totally. You know, the, the barbells are literally bending yeah. because there's so much weight Big on them. Weight. Literally. Big weight. Literally. Like he, if, if he dropped that weight, on someone they're dead they're straight up dead mm -hmm. but so he would say things he'd say uh ain't nothing to it but to do it mm -hmm. and i found myself repeating that sometimes he's saying uh ain't nothing but a peanut <laughs> yeah i heard that one ain't nothing but a peanut ain't nothing but a peanut <laughs> ain't nothing to it but to do it and he'll say uh lightweight lightweight, lightweight. I heard, yeah yeah he goes, i've heard uh, that before and he goes everyone want to be a bodybuilder but no one want to lift these heavy ass weights <laughs> I do though, Ooh, but that could be translated into other aspects of life. Like everyone yeah. want, wants to be a comedian, but no one wants to wait outside an open mic for three hours, you know? So it's like mm. everyone wants to be a podcaster, but no one wants to podcast every week. So mm. that's good. You could, you could translate these things into every aspect of life. Shout out to Ronnie Coleman. Haven't had, haven't haven't talked about him once on a podcast. So shout out to you oh, bringing I'm him glad. up. Yeah, Ronnie what a, Coleman. What what a go he he is. What's a total uh, go and and I mean not to plug another podcast, but I was listening to him on Rogan, mm -hmm. and he now like can barely walk. Yeah, he has he, all these health issues, but he's still at least on the podcast. He had such a positive attitude and was still, in my mind, a very inspirational person. Just just in what he's accomplished and what he continues to accomplish as essentially a handicapped man. Yeah, you should you should check out. Uh, I believe they have a Netflix documentary that came out just a couple of years ago, and it shows the post career life of him. And it's it's something, man. It, you know, when you have somebody that was that massive and lifting heavy weights, and like he definitely has a lot of physical troubles now. Because right, of he all was those doing years of steroids. Lifting. I'm sure all sorts yeah. of crazy. Oh, shit. the circuit. Yeah. I'm sure he had all the circuit yeah. going through him. Yeah. What's a uh, what's an area of your life you need to put more effort into? Oh man, uh, I need exercise more. I need to eat healthier. You're about to go for a hike after this. You're you're doing it. Yeah, I'm trying baby steps, one, but one I need a day. To more. My challenge: sixty minutes. That's all you need. Sixty minutes a day. You're right. Even but, if it's yes, a walk, but, a hike, doesn't matter. Sixty. You're minutes. You're absolutely right. But yeah, I got to do that more. Okay. I got to write more, stand up, mm -hmm. and I got to eat a little bit healthier. Those are probably the three things. My do you three find, biggest drugs. Do you find you write? your comedy most during certain hours of the day or does it just naturally like you might part like, of uh, part of it is just sitting being i have kind of uh i don't know if i believe in add but i i have okay. a hard time it's focusing, all mind. so hard time is just sitting down with myself and a notepad and shutting everything off shutting my phone off and shutting that's a hard thing to do for me yeah. 
So it's really just the act of doing it is what's hard, not mm -hmm. finding the time. It's more just the act of being able to turn, being alone with myself. Totally. It's a hard thing to do. So what if, I, that. what if I, what if I told you I, I have a secret sauce to solving that problem? Oh, so you know how, me, baby. here you go. Here's an example. You, okay. you knew this podcast today was at 4 PM. So you knew today when you woke up 4 PM, you had to be sitting in this seat to do yeah. this podcast. As you know, with every other podcast that you do and you book it, do that with the comedy, give yeah. yourself an hour window and just block it out the night before. So, you know, the next day, like three to 4 PM, doesn't matter what else is happening in the world. I already have this locked in on, on the cow and then you that's just fucking do it. Time. And that's, that's, that's how I do it with when I do like a lot of the solo pods, when I need to like actually sit down and think through what I want to talk about or any, just anything creatively I put it yeah. on the cow and then I go, there's no question. I have one hour to just go all in on this. And then when that time's up, I move on to the next thing. But it's so easy to go, ah, not really in the mood because you didn't mentally prepare yourself today to do it. Right. You know, no, you're right. You're definitely right. I need to do that. Try I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Try yeah. it, try it, try it. Yeah, yeah. So so there's that. I got, I got my solution for that. There we go. And then, um, and yeah, just my other addiction is is that uh, sugar rush or that salt rush at the end of the night. You know, at two in the morning, I get the, or midnight, I get these cravings to go get a double-double at In-N-Out, you know? So it's... <laughs> Pretty hard not to resist that. It's hard. As, as an Five adult, bucks like, to, to, to put a smile on your face sounds good to me. When you're a kid, your parents are there to go, no, you don't get in and out right now. Eat healthy. You know, you'll have breakfast in the morning. Yeah. But as a 31 year old man, there's no one stopping me. I got the five <laughs> bucks for the burger. I have a car. What's no, there's no one to stop me. No. So I just usually do it and I got to not do it. <laughs> You know what they say? First step is acknowledging. So you acknowledged it. Now you just got to stop doing it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but hey, overall, I'm good. But those are my weaknesses. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. But it could be a lot worse. So that those are those are all uh, those are all easy things to to put more effort into. What um what's the first step anyone can take to reaching their inner potential? What do you think? What is the first step? Uh, the first step to reaching someone's inner potential. inner potential. Well, you got to go for it. I mean, you can't think about it. You got to do it. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I see all these people who will come up to me after shows. And, I, you know, I'm just relating this back to my world. There's obviously, I'm sure most people who listen to your podcast don't want to be a comedian. They have their own ambitions. Maybe you want to do YouTube or maybe you want to start a mechanics shop. I don't know. what. Maybe you want to start a hair salon, whatever it is that you want to do. You could come up with a million excuses not to do it. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I have to take care of my family, whatever it is. They're all good excuses. But if you really want it, you got to just go for it and do it because mm -hmm. no one's going to do it for you. Chances yeah. are you're not going to meet a person that goes, oh, you want to do that? Let me let me do it. Take Do it with you. Like yeah. you just got to you just got to go for it. And you never appreciate uh, things as much as you do when you actually do the work. So it's like you were talking earlier. It's like, well, I want to start a podcast, but I want to produce it. Well, the beauty of you producing the podcast is that when the time comes and you can pass that torch to an actual producer, you have the knowledge of how to produce a podcast. And then you feel a sense of you'll be able gratitude to hire a better for the producer. process. Yeah. And you'll be able to hire a better producer because you'll exactly. know the basics to do it yourself. Whereas you won't just blindly say yes to anyone who says they know how to produce a podcast. Because let me tell you, there's good producers and there's bad producers. And if you yeah. know nothing about what you're doing, someone's going to come in and you go, wait a minute, uh, <laughs> that's not the, you shouldn't be using that. Why are you using that microphone? And they're like, yeah. this is the microphone I use. And you're like, do I know more than you? <laughs> Problem. Always hire experts that are smarter than you around you, right? Right. Yeah, no, that's good. That's a good, uh, that's a good piece of advice. Um, as we wrap up this podcast, I always allow the guests to put a challenge out there to the listener. So if the, if the listener made it, an hour and 17 minutes into this podcast. What is one challenge you have for the listener today as they wrap up this podcast? Wow. Challenge. I wish you gave me these questions ahead of time. These are no, good, no, good no. questions. Got to be on the they're spot, good baby. questions, but they're hard. These are, <laughs> I feel like I'm, no matter what I say, I'm going <laughs> to, an hour later, I'm going to be like, wait a minute. This is what I should have said. <laughs> this is a challenge I should have given you guys. Okay. Can, can you just, I want a little help here. What? Yeah. Give me some examples. Yeah, so some examples would be like some some examples could be like you know I, uh, a challenge could be like 
call call a loved one that you haven't spoken to in a while and, and talk to them or write down th- three things you're grateful for. Uh, uh, as After this podcast, think about what is the first step you can take to actually doing the thing you've always wanted to do. Um, you know, ask yourself, um, ask your the challenge could be like, ask yourself, who are the people you're surrounded by the most with right now? Do they inspire you? If not, how should you move on and find other people? So it could be a magnitude of different things. Okay. I'm going to be a villain here. Let's you ready? This is going to be, this is not going to be good for anybody to do, but you all have to do it because it's the challenge game. And if you're a fan of Bobby's, you got to do it. <laughs> if you're a fan of the show, you got to commit to these challenges. Don't be a pussy bitch. <laughs> Um, okay, here's the challenge. Here it is. I want everyone to go out there and perform a petty crime. Ooh. Maybe steal a candy bar from the grocery store while you walk around and eat it while you walk around shopping and don't Ooh. pay for it. Uh, you know, maybe pee in public. I don't know. Do something a little bad. Maybe and if you're well, in a state where marijuana is still illegal, go out there and smoke a joint. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not tell- I'm not going to tell you what crime to commit. But I want it to be nonviolent. These are I want this to be non nonviolent crimes. Yep. <laughs> and I don't want you to steal from an individual. If you're gonna steal, steal from a corporation, uh, like a big conglomerate type of thing. You know, you guys know what I'm trying to say here. They're, I don't, they're I'm picking not, up what I'm you're not, putting down. I'm not promoting being an evil person, but I want you to go there and just be a little bit of a bad boy or girl, be a little naughty boy, naughty girl. That type and make and make sure when you're doing it, you're sending an Instagram video directly to Ari so he can keep a tab of what all you naughty boys and girls are up to. Yeah, I want you guys to go out there and be a little bit for naughty. sure. The first harmless but naughty to be harmless clear. but naughty for yeah. sure. The first villain to put a challenge out there in that world. So I gotta say, you know, props to you for thinking outside the box. On I'm that. trying to be unique. I never said it. I never said different. it had to be a positive challenge. So you definitely took a different route there. You definitely took a different route there. Um, yeah, all right, dude, up. dude. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on this podcast. I can't tell you, um, when, when I came through to do that podcast with you, I think you could probably see it in the visuals when you play it back. I could I could see it when I was watching the video, but uh, I was like, even when I first walked into the studio, like I know that is such the norm for you because that's just where you operate out of, but it was a taste of like where I want to be and it gave me so much inspiration. But then not even just that, just getting to know you, really diving into a lot of your story and some of the podcasts you've been on, you are literally like, an ideal candidate for this podcast because that's the purpose of this podcast is like it doesn't matter if you're into comedy podcasting you want to be a chef uh it's about giving people the inspiration to hear a story of like this is somebody that wakes up every day does what they want to do but like it hasn't just been all beautiful the entire journey because there has been a time in my life where you know i woke up i didn't know what i fucking wanted to do after college and i think we talked about this on a little bit on your podcast but I still create, even though I know my passion, my purpose, I know where I'm going. I still create for that younger version of myself because I know what it feels like to be lost as I know you do as same as well. And, uh, I just think your story is exactly what this podcast is all about. And I, and I really appreciate you taking the time, man. Thanks for having me. That means a lot. And man, the beginning of this episode and the end, you just, you pump me up, man. You make <laughs> me feel good. Uh, so maybe if podcasting doesn't work out, you could be a motivational speaker or something. Uh, hey, might have to give it might have to give it a go. Hopefully you can use this little pump that I'm giving you to cruise up the mountain. So if if somebody's going on this hike with you, they're gonna be like, what the fuck were you on, Ari? Like, why did you run up this mountain and leave me in the dust, dude? That's the plan. Ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed this podcast, please, please, please screenshot this episode, post it to your IG story, tag Ari. He's at Ari Manis. That's A-R-I-M-A-N-N-I-S. Tag him on IG, tag me at Bobe. That's B-O, three B's, four A's and a Y. Share out the podcast on your IG story. Let us know what the biggest learning and the takeaway was. In the description below, I'm going to have uh, Ari's YouTube tagged. I will have his podcast tagged there. I highly, highly, highly recommend you guys and gals go check out his podcast. It's fantastic. I was episode 129. If you want to kick it off with the Bearded Man, please do. If not, if you want to skip that episode, please do. There's plenty of others. There's 128 other episodes plus the recent ones he dropped. So, I think you got plenty to choose from. Um, but yeah, make sure you give this guy a follow. And uh, Ari, thank you again for taking the time, man. It was an Thank you. Pleasure. It was great. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Bearded Man Podcast. See you.